your storm you're hurting now but your morning is coming so hold on to Jesus and ride out your storm hold on to Jesus and ride out your storm Wasn't that a blessing? Amen. I was thinking about that in Paul when he was in that storm in Acts. He said, the words he said, there stood with me the angel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we're surely thankful that in the midst of our storms that we've got somebody that's going to always be there right by our side. Amen. Helping us out. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I've always thought about this too. The apostles, the, uh, the disciples, while they were on the sea, every one of them the next morning seen the daylight come. Yes. Amen. And we just uh, just stay right there. I mean, a storm's pretty rough sometimes. Yes, yes. Just always remember God's in control of it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Got just a few announcements to make uh, this morning, but we'll be at Galatians chapter number one. Uh, in Galatians chapter number one, verse number uh, 10, please. Uh, in the jar, we uh, counted it and deposited it this, w this week, and we had uh, $245.55 in it. Amen. So we thank the Lord for that. And then don't forget now this coming, uh, this coming month, uh, which is day after tomorrow, uh, that uh, don't forget about the Easter sunrise service. Uh, that'll be on the 20th, and we're going to be here to church at 730, and we'll be having a morning service, and then after that, we'll eat breakfast. And then after we eat breakfast in the fellowship hall, we'll come back out for some great preaching. Got some stuff lined up that I know that God is going to bless. And so we're, we're looking forward to seeing what God will do. And then on that Sunday night, we'll come back at 6 o'clock. 
Uh, we won't be having any, uh, any Sunday school that day or choir practice, either one. Uh, but anyway, on Sunday night, we're going to have something very special uh, that probably you've never seen before. And uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you. And I know a fellow said one time, I'm gonna, if you'll come to church, said, I'll show you something that you've never seen before. And when they got there, he held up an egg. He said, you ain't never seen what's inside that egg yet, have you? So I'm not going to fool you like that, I promise you. Amen. Amen. And another thing he did, he swallowed a, a goldfish. I ain't going to do that either. If, you go, if you're going to come to church, you're going to do it without all that stuff. Amen. Amen. God's got something special for us on Easter Sunday night. Don't forget now, ladies, the uh, ladies uh, uh, meeting at uh, Anchor Baptist Church in Columbia. And that'll be uh, on the 3rd of May. And on June 21st, the ladies meeting at Living Faith. And then uh, also the uh, ladies meeting uh, here at the church on April the 12th. And then men's fellowship on the 19th. And so we've got a lot of things going on, and, and of course we want you to be a part of that. And like I said this morning, Sunday school, don't forget next Saturday, Corey and Ashley will be getting married, and we're looking forward to putting them in purgatory. Uh, but anyway, uh, just <laughs> somebody said, I don't believe you like being married, preacher. Now, let's put it this way. If God takes my wife from me, there ain't going to be no more. <laughs> I asked Miss Jenny and Miss Shirley, I said, don't y'all want me to hook you up with some of these old retired preachers or something? He said, no. <laughs> yes, sir. They didn't want nothing to do with that. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something. I've been, we've been married soon be 42 years, and I don't regret it. I don't regret it. And I'm thankful that God is able to put a family together. And then after he puts it together, he can keep it together. Amen. You make God the center of your home, and I promise you, you'll be together. Yeah. Amen. You'll be like Preacher Bartlett and them, about 50 some years in marriage, and, and Brother Joe and them, and others, and Brother Arnold and them, long, long time. God bless uh, this, this thing of marriage and uh, the true marriage. Yeah. It doesn't just, uh, it's not a contract. Amen. It's a commitment uh, to one another's love. And, and of course, God says it to become one. And that's a miracle that God works in the lives of children. Amen. We're looking forward to the wedding, so don't, don't forget about that next Saturday at 2 o'clock. All right, in, in the Bible this morning, Galatians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. Galatians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. And we'll take our text from here, but we'll also be looking at some other verses in this chapter uh, this morning. Look at verse number 10. It says, For... Do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Brother Kenny, lead us in prayer. Father, we come to you once again. We want to thank you, Lord, for this allowing us to come to your house today. Lord, we thank you for a place where we can come and hear you. Yes. Uh, songs about you, Lord, and uh, the teaching about you, Lord. And and the preaching of your word today, Lord. We pray for Brother Thomas, Lord, to touch him and anoint him today. Oh, Lord, and give him what we need today. Help him to stand and say, Dust says the Lord. And God, we pray, just thank you for your word today. We've got, yes, we've got your word with us, Lord, and we can take it with us and we can read it and study it. We thank you for your word today. Pray, Lord, for somebody here today that's lost and undone, Lord, you break your heart. Today. Yes, sir, Lord, God, help us. Or maybe somebody's walking to get this way. Lord, you draw them back. And pray, Lord, as we go out in this world, you know, we that light you call us to be. Yeah, Lord, yeah. in Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Be seated. We already know, if we know anything about the Scriptures this morning, that Paul is writing to the Galatians who somehow or another were easily persuaded by legalizers and Judaism uh, by, and missionaries that were coming uh, to uh, uh, to, to Greece and other places and were influxing, if you would, their missionaries of, of again, of these legalizers and other, other people around, uh, which we also shows us uh, something about this, that these people, these uh, folks in Galatia uh, weren't uh, Greeks, but they, they, and, they, and they weren't Gentiles, they weren't Jews, but in fact they were barbarians, according to what we read and understand from the Word of God that these people were just barbarians. But it also lets us know that we can see in the heart of Paul, the very heart of God, that God would even 
allow him to go into the presence of barbarians and preach the gospel unto them shows us that God loves even bar bar barbaric people in this world. And there's no doubt in my mind that he does, uh, for he has saved me. And I'm glad for that this morning. And then we notice here that as Paul uh, was uh, writing to them, uh, that we see that, that in verse number 6 of this thing, Paul said that he was marveled on how easily they were, they were taken away from the gospel that had been preached to them. He said it marveled him. Now, what this means is that they have, they have been torn away from the truth that he had preached to them about the cross, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and now they have been persuaded into other things. And so Paul is writing this letter to them to let them know that if any man comes to them and preaches any other gospel than what was preached to them at the beginning, the Bible says to let them be accursed. In other words, uh, that these people need to be pushed and banned away from you if they're going to preach any other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul says again that he marvels at these people. And uh, we want you to think about that word marvel just a little bit this morning. But I want you to think about this. First of all, the word marvel means, first of all, to have your attention arrested in an opposite direction. In other words, you will find that Jesus, a couple of times in the scriptures, was preaching to the people, and, 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 and all the, the, the response that they were getting, uh, that he was getting from these people, the Bible says even Jesus was marveled at it. In other words, it astonished him in such a way that he just stood there and looked at these people and were marveled at how soon that their attention was caught away on something else besides him. And then we'd also know that it causes, uh, if you will, a person to get to gaze at or if you would to stare at somebody because they have been awed by something that they have done in their life. And so Paul now is saying, I am marveled at how soon, my, uh, how soon your attention has been taken away from Christ. And of course, the, again, that was the influence of these other people. Now, if there was ever anything that should be in our lives today is that the world ought to be marveling at us even more that we marvel at them. Now, I, I, I sometimes, uh, you know, if, if you look at the world today and all the things that are going on as far as, as this country is going and other countries in the world, and all the countries are following suit. And what they're doing is they're following suit and setting up the day that God will come take us out of here, and then, then, then the, 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 the time of tribulation is going to happen. But, and, and, of course, then they're going to really marvel then. But then we see that, again, uh, that the world has gone in such a direction that sometimes I just look at them and my mind is carried away from what I believe in and what I trust in at that particular moment just for a minute. Because I look at this thing like this. I look at the world, and I begin to worry about my children. And in my grandchildren, but then I realize and come back to the truth of this matter is that I know if I keep my heart right with God, that whenever it comes time, God will answer my prayer and they too will be saved by the grace of God, by the gospel of Jesus Christ and no other. Amen. Now, they may go to different churches and it may be different at their place than it is here. But the fact still remains, if they don't believe in the same gospel, I'm going to be doing everything in my power to get them out of that church, period. Because I don't want anybody to take my family away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I marvel sometimes. My attention, is that the world gets my attention, and I just think to myself, oh my, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? But we need to understand that yeah, something's going to happen Praise God, we're going out of here. Amen. Now, there's a few things that I want you to think about now. I want to preach just a few minutes on the difference between men pleasers and God pleasers. And as we think about these men pleasers and God pleasers, Paul said, if I'm going to please men, he said, first of all, I shouldn't even be a servant of God. And if a man that is preaching the gospel, a man that's supposed to be living the right life in his life, that he's supposed to be doing, and, and, and then, of course, uh, he, he's doing everything that he can do. The first priority that he has in his life 
is that he pleases God. To please God is more important to you this morning than any other thing on the face of the earth. Because I'm going to tell you something, if God is not pleased in you, that means that first of all, the Holy Ghost is not in there. And salvation does not rest there. Because when God looks at the saved, he looks at the pleasing Son of God, that the Son of God pleased him in every way. And we know that God gave his approval of his Son many times in the Word of God and said that he was pleased with what he was doing. Amen. Amen. And if he lives inside of me, then God lets us know that that's what he sees in us and should be pleased with us. But then we need to turn our attention then to the scriptures here and look at this. And I want you to think about this, number one, this morning. I think this morning that Paul, again, was marveled by the removal of the gospel out of these people's lives. Now, there was two things that happened in their life that Paul was concerned about that had been removed by some other preaching. And number one, if you read your verses there, you'll find that the call that God had put on these people was one of the things that they were removed from. There was a call of salvation came upon them, and they got saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then after that, they were called and assembled to make a church. And so the calling of God was on their life, but with this legalism and Judaism that came in, they were soon removed from that, and they were going in an opposite direction other than the call of God. And so Paul was marveled at the removal from the call of God on their life. I mean, all that we have to do today is just look around our churches today. Many people are sitting at home this morning that name the name of Christ, and what they have done, they have been pulled away from the calling of God and something else other than the gospel has got their attention and now has pulled them away from the truth of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Because you and I know the truth this morning. If we know anything about the scriptures, we know the truth. And the truth is that all of God's children ought to be in church. Amen. And it ought to be a priority in our lives. All of God's children ought to be praying. All of God's children ought to be witnessing. And so all of these things are there. But how soon and how easy men can be pulled from the calling of God in their life. Right. Amen. And so I, I look at it like this. Once a man's been called of God, that call is always there. Yes, sir. And so I wonder sometimes, and I marvel too, at the how soon they are removed from that call that God has put on their life. Amen. How soon that comes happen. Here's a bunch of people that knew the truth. And the truth had set them free. But now here come some missionaries from around Jerusalem and Judea. And they come around there and they begin to change their mind on this thing called the church. And so they're called away. They're pulled away. And Paul said, I marvel at this. My attention is upon them. How swiftly they've gotten my attention because the call of God has been swiftly been taken away from them. Now, you, you understand this this morning. What I'm trying to do is get you to understand that one of the most dangerous things you'll ever do in your life is to move, remove yourself from the goal, call of God. The will of God. The second thing I notice here is also uh, that how soon they were removed from the grace of God. And, and because the Bible says here, uh, again, in verse number six, says, I marvel that you're so soon removed for him that called you into the, into the grace of Jesus, of Christ, unto another gospel. What to think about that this morning. The grace that had been given them had been pulled away from them. Now, I don't know about anybody else, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But to ask, ask, answer me this question, well, don't answer me this question. Answer it to yourself. What would you be doing right now if it were not for the grace of God? I'll tell you what most of us would have to say. First of all, I'd be lost as a ball in high weeds and on my way to hell. If it were not for the grace of God. How easily are people pulled away from this grace? 
And, there, and listen, you don't have to go very far to see how fast that people can be pulled away from grace. There is a sect of people in this town right here where we're at that really believe that you don't know that you're going to get to go to heaven until you die. There is no assurance in them whatsoever. How in the world can you read the Bible and understand the Bible and realize that you can know right now that God has saved you and you're on your way to heaven? But how soon are people pulled away from that truth out of the Word of God and the grace of God is not that important to them anymore. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm in this thing because of the grace of God. Amen. Amen. That's right. And I'm thankful this morning that God has shown me that kind of favor. I'm thankful this morning that God gave me what I needed instead of what I deserved. And this morning, the grace of God means everything to me. And by the way, it was by the grace of God you got up. This morning is by the grace of God you're able to eat, sleep, drink, walk, talk, work, and everything else. It's by the grace of Almighty God. Because right now, if God wanted to, he could snuff us out like an ant under, our, under his foot. Amen. But he said we're by, by the grace of Christ. How in the world are they removed from such a wonderful, wonderful doctrine in the word of God? But they were being removed, David, because of these legalists. And because of these Judaizers that had come around and said there was another gospel. There's only one gospel, folks. For well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God, amen, unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and that's me, amen. I'm glad this morning that God has given us grace, but how soon that they were removed from this thing. And we ought to marvel, we ought to marvel at the fact that how many people today are removed from the gospel and from the call of God. Secondly, this morning, I want you to look with me in verse number seven. In verse number seven, he says, for... Uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, we ought to be marveled at this morning, not only at the removal, but we ought to be marveled at this morning, the perversion of the gospel of Christ. Now, there are three things that this perversion happens, but I want you to think about this. To be, to, to be perverted is something that you need to understand. There's a lot of perverts in this world, that's for sure. But what God is talking about here is being turned from the truth. And also from the purpose of the truth. And then be also to be turned from the right way. And so we realize this morning there are three things that causes a perversion of the gospel of Christ. Number one is perverted men. Amen. Amen. Perverted men. Because you have these men... Uh, that come along and say, well, i tell you what I know about the Scriptures. But I'm going to say something to you this morning. This is a divinely inspired book. This is a divinely inspired book. The Holy Ghost of God spoke every word of this. I believe with all of my heart, I always have, and it's in black and white. In, in some of you's Bible, there's some red in there too. But think about this. This is the only truth that there is. There is no other versions. There are no other authorities. This is the truth of God. I have to believe that in my heart. If I didn't believe that in my heart, let's throw them down in the pew and walk out of here and go home. Amen. We understand this morning that there are men that will come along and they'll pervert this book and say this is what the Word of God says. And because of the ignorance of God's people, they'll turn around and follow them people right straight down the road to hell. We ought to understand this book is, should be rightly divided. And if it's not rightly divided, Brother David, if it comes a day that I don't rightly divide the word of truth, you stand up and tell the church that I'm fired. Amen. Amen. Because listen, there are enough perverted men in this world right now that are taking God's word and God's gospel and they're twisting it around to bring in some sort of a new thing going on in this world. And I'm telling you, the word of God has not changed in all these thousands of years and will not change until the day that Christ takes us home. And when we get home, there'll be a copy of it in heaven and it'll be forever settled in heaven. Amen. Amen. Then there's 
perverted preaching. God said that he'd use the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. There's no doubt about that. But listen, for a man to stand up and literally just deny the word of God from the pulpit and people lap it up like a cat does milk. It's amazing to me how soon people are removed because of perverted preaching. I thank God this morning that it's still by the grace of God that you save. Thankful this morning that it's still God who does the convicting and the pulling and the drawing and the saving and the washing and everything else in salvation. I don't have to do a thing. Amen. He did it all. Yes, sir. And there's people that tell you right now, oh, listen, before you can get in our church, you're going to have to clean up first. You understand that Jesus said, are you a bunch of hypocrites? He said, first wash the outside of the pot, and then you think everything's all right. He said, first wash the inside, Amen. and the outside will take care of itself. Amen. Amen. And of course, we already know that the gospel has been perverted because they've taken something out of the preaching of the gospel. And you know what the number one thing, Brother Arnold, that they're taking out of the gospel today? The blood. Yes, sir. The blood. Amen. They don't like that. The world doesn't like that. So let's make us a version that don't have blood in it. I'm glad there's blood pursing, just pulsing through the Word of God. Amen. And it goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Amen. It started out with the blood of a man killing his brother. Now it's the blood of Christ that has saved us by His grace. And it'll be the blood of Christ whenever we get to heaven. Amen. Before it's bulls and goats, but now it's the Son of God. Amen. That blood, if you don't have that blood, your sins are still present. Amen. Amen. I've got to move on here. Number three, we should not only be marveled at this perversion, and, 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 you know, and, and the removal, but this morning we ought to be marveled at the pleasing. And we go to verse number 10. And the question is, just who is it that you would want to please the most? Who is it you want to please the most? Now, we're supposed to live a life in front of men that we have a good report. Amen. But it does not say that we have to please them. But now, you're, 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 you think about this now. We're talking about the gospel. The gospel is the thing about it that, that we need to understand. Just who is it that we want to please in the gospel? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. If it were not for the suffering of Christ, who would you go to for comfort? That's right. Are you still with me now? Yeah. Amen. If it were not for the cross and the death of Christ, where would your soul be bound to? If it were not for the blood shed on Calvary's cross, your sins again will still be with you. Right. Amen. If it were not for the burial of, of the Son of God who took upon him our sins, amen, and then took it and put it, as may man, put it in the grave where it belongs, what would you do without that? And then the resurrection of Christ. What would we do if we didn't have a living God? We'd have dead gods like everybody else in the world. We'd have statues of fat people and everything else in this world uh, of, of, of just people uh, that believe that, that this man was God and that person was God, this woman was God, that cat was God, that dog was God, and the calf is God, and everybody in the world will be sitting around wondering today, who is the real God? But I can tell you this morning, by the grace of God, he is a true and living God. Since the center seat in heaven, he's not dead, he's alive. His son's not dead. He's up from the grave by the power of God and he still lives today. And you say, how do you know? Because I know he lives inside of me. I don't have a dead God. Don't have no dead God. He's alive. If you all ever get that in your heart, you might come alive. Amen. You think about it this morning, the fact that we got a living God. And, 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 I, and I wonder this morning, of, of the pleasing that people want to do to please some man or please some false God. It amazes me. And how many people don't want to please God? Now, 
here's the world we live in and I've got to move on this morning. I want you to think about this. We live in a world right now that it's self-pleasing. Right. Let's see what the flesh wants and let's give it to the flesh. Yes, and the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. Right. Amen. But the Bible also says be sure and know that your sin shall find you out. Amen. And you can laugh at that, snuff at it, whatever you want to do with it. But I'm going to tell you something, it will come. Right. Amen. I'm paying for it and so will you. Right. And then also, I, I don't I understand this, also is the, the pleasing of sinners. You know, I've seen this happen so much where they pat them on the back and tell them what they're doing is all right and it's just natural and and all this stuff, and God will take you to heaven anyway. But in, listen, you cannot condone what they do. You cannot condone my sins as much as I cannot condone yours. And I sure can't condone the world's sins. So why would we want to please the sinner? We would please the sinner by just simply leading them to Christ would be enough. Amen. Now, that's enough to marvel at, isn't it? That God would show us that Paul was marveled at these things. He just blew him away. Amen. Of how soon and how fast that they were removed from such things. But now, with that thought in mind, the Lord give us this thing to think about now. There are four things that will please God. Now, I told you I was almost done. I am, so just hang in there. Uh, the other Baptist churches have already beat you up to the smokehouse anyway. We should want to please God. We should want to please God. I don't like doing that. I can't stand for a preacher to do it. And I don't know why I did it. God help me. Amen. But there's four things that always pleases God and has pleased God down through the years. Number one, Isaiah 53, verse 10, the Bible says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Yes. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for his sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. It pleased God by his sacrifice. And if, and if God was pleased with the sacrifice of Christ, then we should please God with the sacrifice of ours. Because there's no way in the world that you can tell me you're alive this morning without Him. There's no way in the world you can tell me that you're on your way to heaven without Him. There's no way in the world you can tell me your sins are forgiven without Him. There's no way in the world that you'd be living the life you're living now if you're living right with God without Him. And so why not should we give God what is justly His? For you are bought with a price. You're not your own. You belong to God. And so therefore God says sacrifice. In the book of, book of Hebrews says that we, we ought to do it. And because we ought to do it is because we love him. Amen. Amen. We ought to give him that sacrificial thing. We ought to sacrifice in prayer. We ought to sacrifice in fasting. We ought to sacrifice in giving. We ought to sacrifice in witnessing. We ought to sacrifice everything that we've got. Lay it down before God. Put it on the altar. Let him take a knife and slit its throat. Amen. Let the bloodletting begin in the house of God. Amen. Number two, John 8, 29. The Bible says, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Now the deeds that Jesus did are far beyond our abilities. Because he's God. But what about the other deeds that God wants us to do? Now, this is a sore spot in most Baptist preachers and most Baptist churches in this world. These are people that say they're saved, but they don't do a thing. Right. Amen. Amen. Don't do anything for the church. Don't do anything for anybody else. Just won't do anything for their brothers and sisters in Christ. Just won't do it. What we ought to do is be ashamed of ourselves. Yes, sir. But to please God means that you do what you do because you love Him. And James said... 
If you've got faith without works, I'm going to show you my faith by my works, by my deeds. I'm going to show you I love God by my deeds. I'm going to show you that I serve God by my deeds. I'm going to sh show you that I'm the servant of God by my deeds. I'm going to do it because I do it because I love him and I love man and I want to see him get saved. Amen. Amen. Thirdly, number three this morning, pleasing him. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Old-fashioned foolishness is what the world calls it. A stumbling block. They say you're crazy, you spit, you stomp, you snort, you shout, you do all those things. So why in the world do you do that? Well, because the Holy Ghost makes it that way. Yes. Amen. Amen. And let me say something to you. I'd rather hear a Holy Ghost preaching than I would anything else. Amen. 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 Just the man of God getting up there sometimes and just letting it rip. Amen. Yes. And as the old fellow said one time, Brother Arnold, let's plow a little close to the corn. Yeah. Amen. Get the weeds out of the corn so that the corn can grow. Let's get the tires out of the wheat. Let's get the trash out of the heart. Amen. Yes. God help us by the foods of preaching. We hear about salvation by the foods of preaching. We hear about clean living. By the foolishness of preaching, we hear about the song of the heart. By the foolishness of preaching, we find out the God whom we love. By the foolishness of preaching, we hear the gospel preached. By the foolishness of preaching, we hear the end of time coming. And by the foolishness of preaching, we know that Jesus Christ is on his way. And the foolishness of preaching just keeps on going and keeps going and going. And there's the, old word, there's the word that everybody uses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Amen. Old-fashioned preaching Amen. pleases God. Lastly, this morning, Hebrews eleven six, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Right. Faith pleases God. Mm -hmm. The question again, just who is it that you would want to please the most? Right. Right. Amen. I have a desire in my heart and I know it's a desire that God has given me that first of all, that I'd trust and believe in him more than anything. I've got faith this morning. Amen. I had no faith. Had no faith in God nor his people. Right. And I didn't have no way to come up with faith. But he gave it to me. Amen. He gave it to me. And if he gave it to me, I sure want to practice it. <laughs> I, there's no way in the world that I could preach without him. No way Brother Arnold, Brother Johnny, Brother Bartlett, or any other preacher, any other servant of God could ever do anything without him. Right. Amen. Amen. And I just want to please him in preaching. I want to please him in my deeds, and I want to please him by my sacrifice. Which one is it? If you're pleasing man, you don't deserve to be called the servant of God. Right. Amen. Right. And neither would I. I'm glad this morning that we can please him. Now, let's bow our heads very quickly. Brother David, if you'll come and play that song that you always play. Near the cross, I believe. Or in the cross. This morning, my question is simply this. How many of you, this morning, don't raise no hands, don't do any of that stuff this morning. But how many have done everything you could do this week to please him?